How's everyone doing today? Good? Yeah? All right. Um, so my name's Taylor, uh, Concrete VC. We, we help uh, large real estate companies see into the early stage tech space and, and, and pick partnerships to do or pick investments to make. Um, uh, and, and I have a pretty fantastic panel here. And so to best prepare them for kind of who they're speaking to, can I just take a quick poll? Who here is in the retail sector? Okay. Industrial and logistics? Okay, a few more. Uh, it's a you. <laughs> sort of real estate, sort of, I don't want to say non-tech, but like traditional real estate? All right. And then the tech people? Okay. All right. Those are your targets. Um, so I'm super excited to be on stage with a really incredible uh, group of people who I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves because they, um, they have done some fantastic things. But can you start, Julie? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Julie Villet. I'm um, heading URW Lab, which is our innovation entity for Unibail Rodamco Westfield. Um, uh, for those who don't know, but Unibail Rodamco Westfield is the global um, leading developer and operator for shopping flagship destinations. Um, and yeah, this is what I do. I was following around. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, Julie, you're doing well. <laughs> Please. Okay, no, good for me. So, my, Mark Bourgeois, uh, I am um, uh, the UK and Ireland Managing Director for Hammerson. And for those who don't know Hammerson, we are a, uh, one of Europe's uh, leading um, uh, developers, investors of uh, flagship retail destinations. Um, say base, half of our portfolio based in the UK, uh, the, the remaining portfolio based in, uh, in Ireland and then mainland Europe. And we invest across f big urban flagship um, destinations and we also uh, invest in uh, premium outlets, including Vista Village. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Sherman Das. Uh, I'm CFO of Seagrow. Uh, Seagrow is probably one of the larger companies that you've never heard of. We're the uh, largest owner of warehousing and industrial property across the UK and across Europe. Uh, it's been a terrific place to be recently. It's, it's kind of very much at the sharp end of kind of the changes we're seeing in consumer behavior and across retails we'll get into as we, as we go through. Um, as you can see, I only own one suit, judging by this photo, and I thought I'd put it on for the PropTech conference today. Um, I was previously the, uh, the managing director and, and CFO of a company called Capco, uh, which owns Covent Garden, among other things. So a bit of experience of both the retail and the, and the industrial side. And I only own one cardigan by the look of it. <laughs> well, so I think we're okay. <laughs> Times are tougher. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can retail it is. And Julie, is that the same shirt you're wearing in that photo? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a different blue jacket that I'm wearing. It's, it's slightly different material. Um, so, so, yeah, changing. Just um, it's fashion. You guys are all seeing the change. Um, so. As a VC, we like to look at what the customer is doing. Customers are behaving differently. Um, and, and so a lot of sectors are changing. Retail is changing. And that's having knock-on effects on everything else. So let's talk about how retail is changing. Ju Julie, what are you seeing? I think what, we, what, what I really want to start with is this idea that everything starts from the consumer. And people and the way people are living and consuming and shopping is changing, definitely. What we see, if I should pinpoint maybe four big things, and maybe we can bounce back on that, is this idea that everything is atomized uh, everywhere, anywhere, um, pretty much everything, anything. Um, and I heard those two facts that pinpoint my mind. One is Uber Eats will deliver in Toronto Airport, Q319. Second, I think in Coachella uh, Festival, uh, Amazon Prime lockers were there for the dancers and people attending the festival. So it gives a taste that people want anything, basically, any, anytime. And this is one big thing that we should face and bring answers to that change. Uh, I think if we should pinpoint three other things, maybe it's one, this strong uh, rise of consciousness, in a way, uh, that is also changing the way they perceive us, objects, consumption at large. Um, I, I come across this stat, I think, a few weeks ago that 49% of um, UK shoppers basically 
turned down a brand in the last 12 months because the way they perceived their ethics was not good anymore. So what does that mean for us in terms of what kind of people do we bring in and what kind of partners do we choose? So this is the second thing in terms of how people are changing. And the two last things are maybe the, the, this, this race in a strange way we, in this world that is ever more connected, digitalized, this growing feeling of loneliness in a way. Uh, people declaring they're spending too much time on their mobile. Even teens in the US recognizing this, even the most happier countries in the world, be it Norway, Denmark, all the Nordic countries, seeing more and more like mental health problems in their younger class age. And so what the, this means is connected to my fourth point is how much more important is everything related to experience compared to product related. Um, when you listen to what people say, they say, for almost 80% of them that they would give more importance to an experience-driven product or time spent than product itself. And when you look at how their expenditure is spent, we see a rise of 10% in the last 10 years on experience versus product. So when you put this together, there are big challenges for us. And also, of course, this is dr driving change in the retail uh, offer and in the way retail is operated. Uh, but I would say everything starts with consumer and then of course in, in, in answers to that retail is changing because retail needs to bring some new answers to that. But maybe Mark can bounce back on this one. Yeah, indeed, I'm, I'm picking right up on, on, on that theme. I mean, everything uh, Julie says around ch uh, it starts with the customer um, and, and all those, those trends I agree with. So how's that playing out in the, in the retail uh, in the retail industry right now. I mean, it is probably the most volatile it's been, certainly 2018, 2019, and the, 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 the evolution of, uh, well, actually it's almost a Darwinian uh, evolution is accelerating between those retailers who've managed to absolutely maintain a, a, a great customer proposition which is sustainable and those that haven't. So as a business, we saw, I mean, and you've all those who follow the retail, you'll see uh, the level of administrations and failures across the uh, across the industry. You know, we saw um, uh, 86 failures across our business last year. Uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the restaurateurs who had kind of rolled out on PE and didn't really have a proper customer focus, and now we're seeing some of the fashion brands. So you got Arcadia, uh, you got um, Debenhams, and we had uh, from the department store space House of Fraser, and these are these are businesses that uh, just we haven't been able to invest as quickly to match that, those consumer trends that, uh, that Julie's pointing to. Haven't been able to, uh, to, 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 to move quickly enough. And as a result, people uh, are no longer um, shopping in those stores. And what, and what we're seeing then is, is, whilst that sounds like a pretty downbeat opener for me, uh, what the, why, why we're hugely optimistic at Hammerson is we're seeing many, many new brands, different brands, um, direct to consumer brands. We're seeing um, uh, there's, there's, there's some pretty you know, contemporary and innovative fashion brands who kind of get omnichannel and are really investing in it. We're seeing uh, a lot of activity with them, and we've 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 seen record leasing in uh, across our business in 2018 in the context of you know record levels of, of CVAs, and we're seeing that continued focus from those brands into 2000 in 2019. So, uh, you know, I think to summarise, the, the Occupy lineup is significantly changing. We've certainly told, uh, you know, our, we, we made a strategic pledge to significantly change, reduce our department store exposure by 25%, reduce mm -hmm. our exposure to what we call traditional high street fashion brands by 20% and replace them with, uh, uh, with, new, with new brands. And that's what, what our leasing team are absolutely focused on. So it's that polarization that goes, um, that comes with this, this distress that moves towards the type of venues that uh, customers I think, appreciate and for us. It, and uh, that big day out, it's that big urban destination that you know, we're seeing. And the brands continue to want to be in these places, um, but we're having to move very fast and deal with some quite painful, um, painful re repurposing of, uh, of, our, of our retailer lineup. Show me if I may, because maybe I can do a transition to... Oh, but you're, yeah. the, you're the moderator. No, no, no. I'm not remotely the exposure you guys have to this, so please. 
No, I, I just wanted to bounce back on what you said around those retailers who've been able to change and how fast they've been able to change and yeah. so. And what we clearly see is the evolution of the store itself, like how Amazing. retailers have been able to change the role of the store and yeah. how much it used to be a sales driven only object when now it becomes something that is multi-purposed place from service to click and collect to ship from store and the the contribution of each store to the top line of the retailer is changing Absolutely. and it it raised all of the sudden uh, new questions around logistics, around supply chain, uh, that we are also trying to facilitate as a landlord for those retailers who are trying to adapt to a new environment. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, I agree with that. Look, look, I mean, first thing, retail is not dead. Yeah. Um, it's odd that I'm on saying this with, with two retail landlords next to me, but you know, we, are, we as consumers are consuming more than we have ever consumed before. The issue is we're consuming it, as, we, as we've all said, in different ways. We're consuming it through different channels, we're confusing it in different places. And the challenge for, for all of our customers is ultimately how do they get their services, how do they get their goods to the end consumer better, quicker, cheaper than they ever have done before. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's, it's fascinating talking to our, our customers who are sort of the, either the retailers or the del delivery partners and, the, and, and how they're looking at evolving their supply chain to figure out how to make this work. Um, but when you read headlines about retail as dead, it absolutely is not. So, so I, I come from this from a very positive point of view. Mm. We see huge growth in our business, we see huge growth in, in, in all of our businesses potentially because you know, it's exciting. Retail, is, retail has always been hard. You know, I, just, just take a look at a picture of a high street from 10, or let alone 20 years ago. There'll be chains that have disappeared, there are chains that have come on. All that's happened is, is that rate of disruption has just been accelerated beyond belief by technology. Mm -hmm. So how that's, how that's affecting us is you know, industrial warehousing property is, is kind of the most generic property you can find. It's literally a gray box with four walls and a roof. But the first time in kind of a generation, there's a ton of investment going inside of these boxes. You know, we talk about kind of what happens inside of our space as being exciting. So you know, it's automation. Uh, it's all about kind of creating uh, sort of new technology to kind of get stuff through the warehouse quicker than ever, ever before. So it's not about racking anymore. It's about the efficiency of kind of the space and how you tie together big inventories in big warehouses in the middle of the country to kind of inventories near all of us, kind of in the London around the M25 and around the North Circular, so that Amazon and everyone else can get it to your front door in an hour. Now you just think about how, f how much effort goes into all of that, making all that happen. You know, the white vans that we all talk about in terms of last mile is just the, 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 the if you like, the, 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 the least uh, innovative part of the whole thing. You know, the really interesting stuff is happening right behind the scenes, which I guess we've all seen you know, with our customers. <coughs> Yeah, sure. but I mean, the, if I may, but the, I mean, I think the uh, the real challenge for the for the retailers is is you know, how to get that product to the customer as, as efficiently and as as, as, as cost effectively as possible. And he, uh, a conversation I was having with uh, I'm sure what I'm saying the H and M team recently. And if you if you go to the H and M uh, store, uh, the concept store in um, uh, in Hammersmith. You know, they now have an, uh, I mean, every item of stock in there is RFID'd. And from a customer perspective, you know, you go on their, their app their, their, and it's, uh, it's the in-store mode. And immediately you can say, well, all right, I want a pair of these brown Chelsea boots. I want to be able to buy them. Uh, have they got them in my size? Yes, they have. I'm going to go in there. So it's quite interesting whether just the role of, of, of you know, how efficient, you know, that, that last mile delivery, does that actually involve people going and picking the stuff up themselves in a convenient location or are we or, 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 or so, so taking I, it to them uh, in their homes and I mean that's the so I think last mile in fact we don't really use the term last mile in the business mm. because actually it's a gross simplification of really what's happening in in our customers businesses um, you know, last mile what's really going on is how do you get the thing that our customers the end the consumer well, exactly where you started Julie the thing the consumer wants to consume how do you get it to them as efficiently and effectively as possible, whether it's at home or whether it's at the point of consumption in a shop or in a restaurant? Yes. That, you know, it's, not, it's much wider, much bigger, this thing, than just, say, a man in a white van yeah. delivering a parcel. Um, it's just, and that, um, it's that, it's that um, widening of the challenge it means that some retailers and some of our customers have kind of got their heads around it a little bit quicker than others, but that's the challenge that I think they're all having to face. 
<clears throat> so the, I mean that that's interesting. That la last mile is perhaps a um, an outdated concept, even as you think about really kind of delivering to the customer. So so one thing is changing though: um, sales per square foot, right? That's changing a lot. And so what does that mean? So if we just sort of back up and talk about real estate for a minute, what does that mean to real estate? What does it mean to repurposing? What does it mean to um, <clears throat> What does that mean for you guys? I mean, Amazon's sticking tents in parking lots, right? So you can pick stuff up and deliver stuff there. Uh, wh what does that mean? What does that mean for you? But I, I, I think if I want to put it simple, um, yes, we are facing unprecedented changes and massive transformation. Um, but at the end of the day, the basics remain the same. So for us, it's all about how do we generate attractivity. How do we generate traffic? How do we bring people? How do we generate love to our places? And first. And second is how do we generate good business for our business partners? So those two ambitions, they have not changed. Whatever the, the massive change environment we're operating in. But what has changed, though, is the way we, we will get this done. How do we generate love and how do we generate be better business for our retailers? This has changed. Um, based on technologies, based on new partners um, and new ways of working, basically. So when you say, how is sales per square meters evolving? How is traffic evolving? Um, I think we can say, back to what I was just pinpointing before, but the, the role of the store, at the end of the day, what, what is important for us is the value of this place is still prime because we're managing to get in their people. And the value of this place might differ from one retailer to the other. We discuss more and more with all those DTC brands or digital native brands that come to us, but they come to us because they want to acquire new clients. They, they don't come to us necessarily to open stores and generate sales on spot. They come to us and say, you know what, you are more performing if I compare what I get from your store than what I would get from buying AdWords on Google. Because the click-through rate I get online is decreasing while the awareness I get from your physical place is making sense. So we have to become multilingual and we have to understand like this way of generating business for our business partners might be different. So this is one, the NVBs, but the other one is when we're discussing, for instance, with restaurant retailers, what we say is not only will you generate sales in your restaurant on, on your terrace, but also we as a landlord, we are transforming asset, our assets into omnichannel platforms, so we have partnered with Uber Eats, Deliveroo, and, and the other leading uh, food delivery platforms to make sure that the restaurants at our malls can actually <coughs> do business here, but also generate business on the old catchment area because we have been facilitating that. And so, so, so let me just challenge you on that a little bit. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about dark kitchens, right? Where the restaurant, the on-premise restaurant, the people will actually do walk-ins to they're 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 doing a decreasing amount of delivering and Uber Eatsing. Are you are you getting into the dark kitchen space or or do you feel like there's excess excess production capacity at your F and B? But f we're we're looking at it okay. because we we do think that because we're such a magnet and because we're organizing our space in such an efficient manner that it would make sense mm -hmm. to basically say you know what if you're living close to a URW location. Not only will, will you have great time when you will come to us, but yeah. also you can benefit from the great restaurant offer we have live, yeah. but also from additional offer. Yeah. And this is just platforming offline space and online space in a good manner. Yeah, yeah it's like it's a halo effect just yeah. by being there and being yeah. uh, the discovery part of it. Yeah, but okay. I've got a couple of, to pick up on your question, uh, a couple of points to, to add to that. More specific examples, uh, uh, yeah. Sales densities um, and uh, OCRs, occupational cost ratios, aren't. As, uh, as relevant at all for us now, uh, and clearly, I mean, Judy listed those points out in, a, in her opener. But the, 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 the purpose of these as brand builders and stimulators of online sales within the vicinity of a, of a store are so important. A couple of examples of le recent ones for us: Rafa uh, just did a pop-up in uh, in Leeds, and just talking uh, over over the tour to Yorkshire, and just talking to the. Rafa team um, just this week, and uh, the, I mean sales were fine from the store, but far, far more important for them was just landing the brand in Yorkshire and the online sales, there was a spike immediately followed the, uh, their landing there. 
Another example that we've used uh, in the past, but it's a, just such a great one, I'm going to use it again, it uh, was in Birmingham, um, Morphe, the makeup uh, brand, American makeup brand who you may or may not have heard of, you know, took the first store outside of London in Birmingham. Uh, they got a beauty vlogger, James Charles, who was actually in the news this weekend, um, uh, he's been, uh, that's another story, uh, was uh, launched this thing, 15 million followers online. <coughs> he turns up, we have 10,000 people turn to the center, we get 11 million online hits about the fact this store's opened and a huge amount of interest in the boring in Birmingham and uh, for Morphe launching their brand in the UK. You know, you, th that's the kind of thing that far, far more important to that business than, um, than necessarily how much they sold from the store that week. So all these, these reasons are why people are taking space, to my original point and Julie's point, people are taking space in these physical places for reasons far beyond just selling stuff. Okay. I think that's right. Look, <clears throat> but to make all of that work, you've got to kind of be able to get your stuff out there yeah. on display, whether it's on the screen or whether it's in a store, and then figure out how you're going to get that stuff to people quickly. Um, I mean, it's fa I mean, you know, say warehousing was all about racking in, in, a, in a bygone era. Today, you know, you look at the amount of money, uh, not just the Amazons, but actually some of those digital native brands are spending in terms of kind of knowing what, what it is they want to be making, how they change their product makeup very, very quickly, and send that through their supply chains so that essentially they've got it literally in that last mile, <laughs> to, to use the phrase in that manner, before we even know we want to buy it. I mean, it's fascinating, actually, and it's all about data. Yeah. You, you look at these, these warehouses, that are, you know, the size of several football pitches now. You know, the, the cost of running one of these things is massive. Yeah. So the amount of investment that the, the retailer are putting in in terms of sensors, in terms of understanding from a data point of view, actually what's happening inside of these, you know, grey four walls and a roof is immense. Um, uh, they're trialling all sorts of things with, you know, with, with electric vehicles, with different delivery modes. Again, a little bit of kind of trying anything to see what sticks. Yeah. But you know, we're at a PropTech conference. That technology that's kind of going into every facet of the, 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 the chain is, is really interesting to observe. And, and that's why it's been so challenging for the retailers in terms of the profitability yeah. of their model. It's yes. just so much they've got to invest in to keep ahead of this customer that's curve. That it's, uh, that's exactly it. Because essentially, you know, Amazon, Amazon started on a sort of a kind of on price and a, and a very kind of singular kind of offer, mm. expanded the product offer, and now has expanded the delivery offer. And essentially, if you don't compete on like-for-like -like terms, you get out of business. I mean, it's extraordinary how that's happened in, what, 15 years? Yeah. Um, you kind of, so you look at the world today and you think, hey, it's not going to change. It's not going backwards again. It's kind of going to go forwards. And I think those retailers that kind of embrace the change, I'm not going to start naming names, but you all know the ones as well as I do. Yes. But, and, but funny enough, we see the back end and you see the front end. You know, those who are kind of adapting the way they're kind of looking at their, their, their warehousing space, we the same ones I, I would guarantee Absolutely. were the ones that you talked about changing the space in their stores. Yeah. 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 And the tech that goes into the stores, using that H&M example, yes. is huge as well. Extraordinary, so, yes. Uh, just to connect all this together. Yeah, but very it costs true. money. It does. The, that, the lady who was speaking just before us was talking about how real estate used to be kind of very much gut feel, and today it's all much more about data. And I think that's happening. I think one of the issues is, I mean, pick a location. You know, before, it, what's a good warehousing location? It's, it's basically what, what it's been for the last 30 years, because that's what everyone says it is. You know, today, you can now run any number of stats and, 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 and in terms of kind of populations, in terms of transport networks, in terms of kind of where you believe kind of demand is going to come from to isolate where you believe the right warehousing location to be. So it's, that's data-led. That's not, that's not gut feel anymore. Um, there's so much happening. It's really quite interesting. Mm. So data, I think that's a good uh, transition point. Um, <coughs> conveniently next on my list. Um, so Showman's talked about how data is having an influence on logistics. Um, can we talk a little bit how data is having influence on the, the, the operator of a, of a collective retail location like a mall? How, how are you guys approaching that, Julie? Um, I think maybe there, there are two sides on, on your question. One is really the, the consumer facing side, like and how can we better address this need for more personalization, more <coughs> like one individual segment, um, and we've been working on that for, for a long period of time. This is what the, first, the first thing. And the second is maybe more how do we become ourselves in the way we operate the mall, a more data-driven company, and how can we share those data, part of those data, and make sure they're accurate to generate more business for our retailer partners. So on the first side of things, consumer-facing side of things, we've been working hard in the last three years to 
ramp up our database basically and know our clients better. Um, so now we're up to almost 10 million qualified contacts. So it's a pretty deep uh, database that is quite well qualified as well, which allows us to have a true understanding of who does what in what, what part of the portfolio. Are you and talking about loyalty and parking? Loyalty, or? so it's, it's, yeah. um, it's this, this, this data, we get it mostly from our loyalty program, that's, yep. that's true. Um, so we've been working hard on this that allow us to bring a better service to our, to our individual visitors, basically. And then we've been compiling, and this is the bridge between the consumer side facing data aspect of things and the more like activable data uh, that we can share for ourselves, our teams and our retail partners. We've been translating all this data into a digital platform. So that, that's our internal code name is the discovery dashboard. So we're gathering there all information brought from the loyalty program data, all information we get from the catchment area, from telco operators, um, whatever, social network screening, uh, startups as well, gathering some extra information on that. And then we add in the third part that is more in mall analytics and, and true understanding of how is flows behaving within each mall. Uh, and from there we get a pretty good understanding of how are things moving and how can we predict things and how can we anticipate things and this allow us to have a better management of our own operations where it comes to maintenance operations but also share data with retailers that could potentially increase their business impact by changing location by activating marketing campaigns um, so of course it's crucial I'm not saying we're there and we're happy because it's a very long way to go and we're still looking for a good partners to improve our in mall analytics. So if, if people in the room are good at this, please show up. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely crucial. And, and and so, Mark, I mean, I'm sure Hammerson's thinking about a lot of the same stuff that um, Unibio, Radamco, Westfield's thinking about. Um, what's, the, what's the ask of the tech community? Like, solve this for me. Wow, okay. That's a, that's a I mean, just, there's, 54. There's, many, <laughs> there's many, but like pick, pick, I don't know, one of your top three. Of okay, them. I think a really interesting one is how we, between the landlord community and the retailer community, we share data in a way that's really useful for our, a, a customer visiting one of our schemes. You know, if you look at, if you, Back to the Amazon um, example, if you think of the Amazon platform and the consumer goes onto an Amazon, uh, into, you know, Amazon Prime consumer, they're, they're online. Uh, Amazon pretty well knows a heck of a lot about that, that particular customer. Um, when you walk into one of our shopping centers, there's a collection of retailers and the, the owner themselves, each of whom have a database on customers visiting their stores. And if there's, and I, I kind of know there is an answer to this, as Julie, Julie knows better than me, this is the, the, the one demand piece. But if we are able to amalgamate that, so a customer walks into one of our centers, they've bought into the, the, the principle of data sharing, they've bought into the principle of saying, okay, I'm going to be transparent, my, my digital footprint here is going to be transparent to this place I'm now entering, and I want to get the best value as a result of that transparency. And in order to do that, I think that uh, customer needs to know that there's an efficient sharing of data uh, and that we know who that person is coming into this scheme. Now, there's clearly lots of GDPR uh, issues associated there, but uh, my sense is that the, you know, the, the millennials uh, coming through now who've just been completely used to digital transparency for all of their lives are kind of pretty, going to be pretty cool with just sharing what they're about when they're in a physical space. So it's the amalgamation of that, that data. Now, interestingly, uh, it was a spin-off from Westfield. The one market people are looking to do this and have been looking to do this. And it involves quite a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, goodwill and, and a lot of trust um, from retailers who traditionally this has been their USP. But that, I think, is, is probably the, the, the big one. OK. How, how much time can we go over? Oh, really? I thought yeah, this and was there's us told. Huh? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you guys have been a wonderful panel. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right.